Leviticus was talking about. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to think about it. It's not an exam question, but... Oh, there we go. Bob's got it. We were talking about a whole chapter designated, I believe, to uh, clarity and God's idea and what God's saying and says about our sexual form, our identity as created in our sexual form, whether we have a foreskin or not. And, and I know some of you were a little embarrassed by the use of my terminologies uh, in a fortnight, fortnight ago, so I'm going to use them again. Um, the foreskin of the penis, okay, is the way God created the male, the boy, the man. And Leviticus 12 was, was moving in around how when a mother, a woman, uh, was, was giving birth to a male child, there were certain uh, things that that mother had to do according to the law. And, and then if she had a, a daughter... Uh, and the daughter was recognized by not the foreskin of a penis, but by the vagina, right? So uh, it's speaking very clearly and very specifically about form. And so uh, I really wanted to, to move on from there, but that's part of our story. It's part of our, we've been talking about how sexuality is dynamic and, 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 and it, we should exercise wisdom in trying to define it. Because there's psychology, there's experience, there's, there's not only form involved in how we express ourselves or feel or gather an identity around sexuality. It's not just Leviticus 12. And so I just really want to be sensitive to that. And, and so we, uh, this morning I want, to, I want to go on to a pretty cool uh, a couple of verses in Scripture and, and a couple of chapters. And the moment I mention them, you know you, where we're heading. Galatians 5. But we're not going to start there. I want to start in Mark 5. And let's start in Mark 5, verse 34. And I'm going to try and stick to my notes as I've been trying to do throughout this whole series on this thing that makes us go, hmm. Verse 34. And he said unto her daughter, I'm going to use my King James Version today because I, I just like some of the, the words in it. So I'll, I'll try and interpret them for you. Um, so just stick with me. Uh, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole in of, sorry, and be whole of thy plague. Now the reason why I'm using my King James is I think it gives us and allows us a little more description. Uh, most other, you know, from the King James we have different variances of interpretations. No, sorry, not interpretations, but... Um, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Translations, hallelujah, of, of Scripture. And those translations are pulled from the core word. And so the idea of those translations is to bring understanding to us, right? So it's not changing the context of the text or the wording of the text, but it's, it's bringing a, a, an understanding to us so that we can grasp it. So, so I want to go back to this so that we can grasp it. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. And... This is an amazing passage of Scripture, and so many messages have been preached out of it, you know. Um, but, but it's interesting what Jesus says to, the, to this woman. His, he addresses her as daughter. And I haven't found anywhere else in Scripture that Jesus does this. He speaks about sons and daughters. He talks about sons and daughters. But I don't find anywhere that he actually identifies an eye-to-eye -eye contact. This is in context, I'm speaking to you, daughter. Remember form, but more than form, person, wrestle, struggle. The dynamic of who this daughter was and what this daughter was dealing with. So, so it's, it's critical, daughter, it's this sense of father speaking to child. And so this morning, father speaking to children. We're gathered here this morning, and maybe you're on YouTube and you're, you're, you're linking in, um, and, and the Father is speaking as the Heavenly Father, and, he, and I believe he's, he's personalizing this, this whole 
context and conversation around our sexuality. Because it's critical that we get where he's coming from and what he thinks. Because we live in a world that doesn't listen to the Father. There's no concept of the Father. But we are children of the Father of heaven because our recognition of faith and our conviction of who he is, as we've heard this morning so powerfully, thank you, Joe, for the Holy Ghost leading you to just lay down some powerful word for us to to, to carry in and carry on. So his address is daughter. He's not randomly going, young lady. He's personalizing it. And so any of us that, that... have wrestled or know someone wrestling with their sexuality, the Father sees you personally. What a moment. Jesus was so sensitive to the moment's requirements. The moment had a woman in it, a touch, the Lord's love, the Lord's compassion, the Lord's power. What? I want you to hone in on the sensitivity, the power of this moment for this woman. To be in a moment with one he created and loves to change the course of this one's life. And, and I don't know about you, but the enemy is trying to muddy up the waters. He's trying to distract us, infuse us, and, and sprout lies amongst us so that many of us will miss the moment. The moment that we need, the moment, the most critical moment of our life where Jesus pauses, where Jesus stops and recognizes the individual in a calamity. Remember, Jesus was, he was on a movement He was on a movement to another moment, but the movement to the other moment, the ruler's daughter who lay ill, that movement to another moment didn't keep him moving past this woman's moment. And I think as a church, we need to be sensitive to our movements to Jesus and what he's calling us to, our vision and our our, our, where we're heading and what we stand for and where we're moving and what we're doing, that we don't miss the moments that Jesus pauses because there's someone here or there's someone around us or there's someone in our life that needs a touch from Jesus. So sensitive to the moment. Jesus was so sensitive to the moment. He wasn't putting back the other moment. He had the next moment covered. And things changed in this moment for the next moment. But Jesus didn't miss a moment. Go in peace. Jesus was more than just saying, go with a blessing. This is a a Greek term, abi in pasim. It means enter into peace as the future element in which your life shall now move. You see, Jesus didn't just say, be blessed and go. He said, I have stopped and I've paused in a moment because your future moments are hanging on this moment. There's a future moment. Now, now woman, you're going to go into a new And church, can I say sometimes we can so easily be so religiously connected and legalistic around our observance and our holding on to the word that we tarnish and we break the opportunity for a moment for someone. And, and the whole goal, I, I think, in sense is, is to speak and to teach us and to pastor us and to shepherd us that we are the church of the living God. Jesus is our head. He is interested in every moment of our life. He's interested in the moments that our community are walking through right now, wherever they are, whatever beach they're on, whatever, whatever club they're in, whatever pub they're in, whatever river they're in, whatever boat, whatever ski, whatever, 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 whatever. And what's happening personally, Jesus is interested. An element is an essential part of something. So if you don't have an element, if one element of your existence, if one element of your space is missing, you're all kinds of messed up. To doctors, if we miss an element, if there's some core element in our, in our body that's failing, just trouble, right? So, so Jesus 
Jesus is, instru is, is he's instrumental to the element. He is that element. So the woman pressed through the crowd because she knew she needed an element of her future. She, there, there was this element she was missing. She tried the physicians. She tried meds. She tried. She spent her whole. She, she was looking for a moment. And Jesus said, I am the essential element of life. So Jesus touched the woman when she touched him. Now faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, what got the woman to the touch? Well, she'd been hearing about this man, Jesus. She'd, she, she, there was stuff being said about him. There, he was, there was reports, there was testimony, there was, there was all kinds of things being said about this man that was pressing through the crowd and she just, her faith drove her to the moment of touch and Jesus recognized the moment that he stopped called her out. The disciples didn't recognize the moment. They're like, it's, come on, what, what are you thinking? You're crazy. There's people pressing. And, he's, and Jesus is like, no, this one has just had a moment. And so everything she'd been hearing about Jesus was, was bound up and, and locked up in this, this faith that she had, a conviction of the truth of something she believed in. She was being moved by conviction, and that's a whole other thing that, that makes us go, hmm. I might just touch on the conviction and convincing at some other point. But I just want to say it right here that the Spirit of God convicts us. He does not convince us. And so this woman, she was convicted. She was moved. She, she just had to have a touch. She, she, was, she was so moved by that, what she believed, because hearing words had come to her ears. She'd heard testimonies and reports that others had been suffering in calamity, that others had been suffering from disease and plague, and, and, and Jesus had done something. Jesus had changed the element of their existence, and so she's pressing. And the disciples are not quite with it. And so I believe the Spirit of God is wanting to bring us up to speed. He's wanting to speak to us. He's wanting us to be in this whole area of sexuality and following Jesus. This woman had a strong conviction that God exists. As the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and the bestower of eternal salvation. She'd been hearing some things that Jesus had said. She had a strong conviction and belief that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was the healer, that she could obtain what she needed. The element of what she needed was in Jesus. The woman had been listening to what had been said about Jesus, what had been testified, and what had been happening around about her, and it produced faith in her to reach out and touch Jesus. So it's critical what we're talking and what we're saying about Jesus, amen? Because our community is listening to what the church is saying about Jesus. And they're listening to what the church is saying about Jesus and his word, and, and they're looking for an exhibit. We are his exhibits. We're the exhibits of God, of his nature and his character. And so this is so critical because the area of sexuality is rampant and the, the pressure in community and society. We're living in an age like my father couldn't imagine. My dad. Born in 1940, never expected and anticipated to be living in an age like this, around the expression of sexuality and identity. Never anticipated it. It was in there, they weren't thinking. It was, there was a rumbling and things were happening because it's been happening for, for, for all time, but we're in an age, and it is critical that we are sensitive to what we say about Jesus. Because there's, there's women and there's men that are listening. And, and remember conviction. I'm not going to get into conviction. Get off conviction. Remember conviction. Conviction is something that gets on your heart. And it's born in truth. It's not born out of an argument. So, so as we stand and as we, as we communicate around this as a church and as we, we, we develop the sensitivity to understand people's moments, the truth is critical. Because it's the truth, remember, that sets people free. So for me, this, I'm not debating anything. It's already revealed. 
And for years, the word has been followed by apostles along the years. The first and, cent first and second century apostolic leaders pointed to this, pointed to these men, pointed to these 12, pointed to the ones that had the responsibility to pull it through into the future, to organize uh, the New Testament understanding and covenant. They pointed back to them. And we're in, a, we're in a society that isn't pointing back, but we're in a society where there are leaders and men and women in church circles that are deciding, let's put this away that aren't pointing back but are standing with an, with an arrogance and going, I have a better translation. I have a better definition. It's not happened until this generation. Come on in with me. Uh, this is serious. Because there's moments, there's people caught in calamity who have a moment that might go There was a young man in the church down south uh, just in the last couple of weeks that uh, was invited to come to a church service by a friend. And this young man came and he heard the message and he responded to Jesus and he, he repented of his sins and he gave his life to Jesus and Jesus is now the Lord of his life and he was handed a, a new membership card at the church. You've just now got saved, you're a member of the church, can we have some of your details and your phone number and, and we just want to stay in touch with you, we want to help you, we want to disciple you. And so he took this card and he filled it out and in his occupation he wrote down, I am an exotic dancer. And I, I live away from Brisbane, but I travel to Brisbane every weekend where I work in a gay bar as an exotic dancer, this young man. He wrote it down with no shame. With, he, was, he was absolutely, he, didn't, he, he just was, this is what I do. You ask me, I'm telling you. And, and so the card was collected and the leaders looked at the card and they're, they're automatically going, oh, okay. Right, they, I, I drive trucks at the mine. I'm a psychologist, I'm a surgeon, I'm a baker, I'm a candlestick maker. Okay, that's okay, that's what you do. This, this, this caused a different response. Now, the reason why it caused a different response is because the pressure of the moment. Pressure of the moment. One week passes and this young man comes back to church. He's not been counseled, he's not been spoken to, he's not had any contact except the friend that took him to church. And just of his own volition, he offers up, guess what I did this week? Oh, bless God, I don't know, what, 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 what did you do this week? And he said, I have canceled my sex change. I have canceled the operation that I had planned because I have struggled with my identity. And now in Jesus, I had a moment last Sunday. I had a moment and now something's become clearer. <laughs> oh, the, the moment that Jesus has with him. And so my heart as a pastor of our church is that we have to love long enough and strong enough for truth to set people free. That we aren't organizing who's in the crowd so precisely that we filter out those ones because we have a prejudice or a misunderstanding or we're caught in the emotion of what do we say and what do we do? We know something's not right here. To be able to talk about it, communicate it, and, and, and move in a space that we know what the word affirms and we know that the word is truth. The truth sets us free. To the LGBTQIA plus community, what they hear about Jesus is critical to this moment. And your future moves, and their future moves into a life of peace. All sexual immorality ruins the moment and robs the future of being all sexual immorality. It robs us of the moment of connecting with Jesus, in humility and in a space, if you're the element that I need, and, and if we're robbed of that moment, 
our future life of peace and movements in peace here on earth and eternity are in jeopardy. They're, they're, they're being ruined. And, and so we as the body of Christ, what do we exhibit? We exhibit the opportunity for a moment for someone to touch Jesus. And we have a whole bunch of instructions about what our lives should look like and what that exhibit, who hold, what he's thinking and what he's doing so that the moments can arise. Now, if I was to stand up with a placard and get on national TV and declare that every sexual immoral, immoral person is going to hell, Potentially, it'll, 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 it'll restrict my, my employment opportunities. There'll be persecution. Now, am I not going to say that because I'm worried about my future? Or am I not going to say that because I'm worried about someone else's future? Now, now, when men and women have done that, I believe they've not been able to take responsibility for an individual's moment because they've been separated from the individual. So if I was to do that, I believe I would be inconsiderate of a moment that individuals are going to hear that statement and, and, and how that statement could ruin their opportunity to have a moment with Jesus because I couldn't be accountable to the individual. I wouldn't be able to have another conversation. There would be a fight and war would be on. So, so as a church, we can't just be saying that. Though the word is true in that. Come on. So I'll say it again to the LGBTQIA community, what they hear about Jesus is critical to the moment of their future moves into a life of peace. With me this morning, as a father to, the ch to a child, Jesus addressed the woman daughter. So today we continue, our father who is in heaven is delicately and exquisitely speaking as a father to the children he so exquisitely loves. Enter into peace as the future element in which your life shall now move. You have touched me. And I have touched you and I've paused. Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, and our solution. Matthew Henry has a, a commentary on this passage of Scripture, and I just want to read it. It is common with people not to apply to Christ till they have tried in vain all other helpers and find them as certainly as they will, physicians in this case of no value as this woman did. Some run to divisions, happy and fun company, sexual expression, identity. Others, I just added those little bits, sexual identity to, to make it about the moment. And he goes on to say, others plunge into business or even into intemperance. Others go about to establish their own righteousness or torment themselves by vain superstitions. Many perish in these ways, but none will ever find rest to the soul by such devices, while those whom Christ heals of the disease of sin find in themselves an entire change for the better. As secret acts of sin so are secret acts of faith known to God. The woman told the whole truth. It is the will of Christ that his people should be comforted, and he has power to, to command comfort to troubled spirits. The more simply we depend on him and expect great things from him, the more we shall find in ourselves that he has become our salvation. Those who by faith are healed of their spiritual diseases have reason to go into So let's go to Galatians 5. I know you've been anticipating Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Why am I got that verse? Who can help me? Uh, 19. <clears throat> Sorry, not 9. No, I've got 19 there. Didn't see the 1. So Galatians 5, 19. Are we there? Now the works of the flesh are manifest. 
Which of these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, um, revelings, and such the like. Of which I tell you before, I have also told you in time past, that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So when I have a look at this word, works in verse 19 it's a deed or an act or a thing done so now the works of the flesh so now a deed or an act or a thing done of the flesh and then he goes on to to identify and describe some of the acts of the flesh this word flesh is a human nature which is frail and caught in passion it's it's an animalistic nature with cravings that incite sin so we have a nature that incites sin in us. It's the flesh. Mere human nature, or the earthly nature of man, apart from divine influence, and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. That's the flesh. Right? The flesh is our nature. It's earthly. It's apart from divine influence. It's prone to sin, and it's opposed to God. So Paul is saying this, these works, these things that we do that come from this space, out of the, not with the influence of God, opposed to the things of God, this is a work of the flesh, and this is all of them. Now, I want to single out the sexual immorality side of it, adultery and fornication, of course, because that's what we're talking about. But let us not forget the flesh nature, the flesh part, anything in us that is opposed to and incites sin. We all have that nature. Flesh is to be noted not to only mean the lack of chastity, the lack of sexual maturity or the sex, of sexual morality. It's to be noted that it's not just about sexual immorality, but Paul uses the flesh to mean the whole man or woman, body and soul, every faculty included, because all that is in us longs and strives after the flesh. Flesh signifies the entire nature of man or woman, our whole sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. That's the flesh. Without the influence of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to the word fornication. It means all illicit sexual intercourse. That word illicit is anything forbidden by law, rules, or customs. Illicit drugs. Everything that's outside of our law, our customs, our traditions. Everything that you can't buy behind the counter. Everything that you can't be described, it's illicit drug, right? So, so everything that, you, that, that we do sexually outside of its prescription. Any sexual intercourse, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, intercourse with animals, close relatives, any sex outside of marriage, young people, non-married people, this is fornication. Acts 15, 20 to 29 says that as they were, the apostles were working through some of the detail of, of what can we tell these new believers, these new Gentile believers, what, is, what can we frame this? What, what, the Jews wanted to bring circumcision and all the law and everything in and let's use that and Jesus. And, and so the leaders of the church went, let's just, we, we ought to just, we just gotta, let's just clarify something. We, we abstain from things polluted by idols, so let's stay away from any other God any other image, anything else that, because there's demonic activity there. God hates it. We're, it, it. Remember who we are. We are we're serving God. So we don't go anywhere near that stuff. And he says, now don't go anywhere near anything sexual immor immoral. No sexual immorality. So you stay away from all those practices. They are of the flesh. And don't eat anything that's strangled or that has blood in it. And, and that was the connection to the sacrificial system. Now, if we were to remove this word fornication, I thought about it. I thought, you know what? If I just blotted out adultery, uh, no, adultery, uh, uh, we talked about adultery sitting somewhere slightly different because the, the world sees if a husband cheats on his wife that someone gets hurt, right? And so 
Let's just leave that. We're not going to focus on that. Fornication, which includes adultery, because it's any sex outside of marriage. But if we just remove fornication from the scripture, it's not just a word. We lose Romans 6, 7, and 8. We lose Acts 15, Acts 21. We lose Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Thessalonians 4. We lose Revelations 9. We lose Matthew 15. We lose Mark. We, we lose the lot. How can we decide to lose the trace element of relationship with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think it's a good time to, to maybe say uh, Life Impact Church does not affirm any sexual intercourse or relationship outside of marriage. So if you're practicing or you know someone's wrestling or you're struggling or you're, 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 you're behaving, there's an action or an activity in your life uh, around your sex life and you are with the same sex, you're with uh, uh, someone else's husband or wife, you're, you're with an animal, you're with relatives, you're doing anything outside of marriage, it's fornication. Now, some use 1 Corinthians 6, 12 as I'm free from all things. Uh, to, it does not speak about this. All things are lawful under me, it says, but all things are not expedient. It is not to be used to exercise the flesh and is clearly not to be used to, in, in Acts 15 and 20 and Acts 21 and Romans and those scriptures I just read, clearly state all fornication is not to be practiced or even named amongst us. Ephesians 5. With me this morning? How am I going? Am I going okay? I'm not going to ask you how you're going just yet. I'm asking you how I'm going. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not even be once named amongst you. Let it not even be named once amongst you. So remember, sexuality is not just simply to do with sex drive or sexual behaviors and actions. It's also including feelings, emotions, and psychology. It's including trauma and connection. It's including, it's including a whole bunch of things, right? So we can't just treat people by a standard. The standard, Jesus sees the people that he wants to treat with it. You see, the standard is the treatment. And, and we, as, we as followers of Jesus have to be careful how we treat the standard with people who need the treatment of the standard. You with me? When Jesus said to the woman, uh, whole, You've been made whole. He was using the, the word sozo, and it means to save. It's to save a suffering one from perishing. Your faith has saved you from the perishing of your suffering and your calamity. Go into a future that only I can bring to you. It is my heartfelt passion that not only do we hold the standard but we let the standard treat the calamity of our cities wrestles in their sexuality. And so I hope this, this series around this is, is helping us just somehow in our spirit just connect the dots. So the LGBTQIA plus community, it's a terminology in the queer community and it's complex. Where's the, where's the, it, it, it's the plus. The plus is because it was LGBT, and then it was LGBTQ, and now there's, it's so diverse and it's so 
intricate and it's so personal that, that not even the community themselves can define themselves. Imagine not being able to define yourself. Well, before you met Jesus and you had that moment, you struggled with that definition. You struggled with who you were. You, you, you were just of the flesh nature. You just were instinctively, because you're separated from the Holy Spirit, you just lived according to the flesh. But Jesus can deal with the flesh. Jesus can set up a future that we can go into, and you and I are walking in that. And is not Jesus the answer for every community that's seeking identity, that's seeking a purpose? So it's dynamic, it's contested, and it's continually developing. There is so much to understand, it's continually evolving. Even an individual that finds themselves represented in this statement finds it hard to describe themselves. A sister of someone caught with same-sex attraction can describe her sister different to her mother's description of her daughter, different to her father's description of her daughter. And this is in a family of four. Jesus is interested in that moment. We can't just be on charge with the truth that we can't respect an individual's moment. Why, how, where, what happened, what was the reason, why am I like this, why? it's difficult to understand. But Jesus, 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 Jesus. The woman tried for 12 years to understand it so she could get to the treatment of it. And one touch from Jesus, her future was reformed. Human nature is dynamic and complex. Matters of the heart Sexual orientation and expression are deep and personal. Jesus knows. Jesus is the one person who carried your struggles and your wrestles in him. You can find peace, meaning, purpose, and identity in Jesus. Queer is an umbrella term that, that can mean any kind of diverse sexuality or gender. It includes people who are born and no form is clear. intersex people. So they're, not, they're just not wrestling with same-sex attraction. They're wrestling with form. And, and if that child was born in Leviticus 12, it would be hard to identify. Intersex people don't have the anatomy to describe their form as male or female. So rhythms of honor and promoting another's prominence always are never not required. Love never fails. So this morning I'm firstly speaking to you, the follower of Jesus who may struggle with the flesh to encourage and affirm you. Galatians 6. One to three, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself something that he is not, he is nothing, and he deceives himself. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous shall inherit, sorry, do you, not, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor the adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor the abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortionists shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. It is reasonable to conclude 
that in the Corinthians church, there were ones who struggled with fornication. There were homosexuals, there were lesbians. Same-sex attracted people. There were, there were those struggling with you know, their, their gender form and their gender identity. And it is reasonable to conclude that such were some of them, that Paul was speaking to ones who in fact had been transformed. They had had a moment with Jesus. And in that moment with Jesus, they were washed, they were cleansed, they were redeemed, they were sanctified, they were set free. And maybe some of us here this morning have never had the opportunity to share with a brother or a sister that you in fact have overcome a wrestle like this one. And, and amongst us and amongst the church, we've not been able to testify and care for one another and share with one another because of the innuendo and the, the, the spirit around sexuality. And so as a church, we've struggled to communicate and connect with one another and create an environment that someone who's struggling with it is welcome here. Because in fact, a person here or, or in any other church has in fact overcome it who has in fact been set free from it. And, and, and maybe out of the, the talking of this, there's the confidence that, that, that ones of us might be able to share that. To bring some context to the moment that you touch Jesus. Context to the moment that, that, that you struggle. Context like the man in, in Rockhampton had a moment with Jesus. And he's on the start of his journey, and, and I don't know about you, but that journey is going to require some people that I just read in Galatians to support him, understand him, to, to not have the answers to all his questions, but to let the Holy Spirit bring joy and peace and a new future into, the, into that young man's life. Paul's constant instructions reveal we all struggle. So out of all the things that he listed there, we all once were them. And so as followers of Jesus, we uphold the banner that we once were strugglers. We were once caught in trespass and sin. And maybe my trespass and my sin didn't offend someone else like yours did or like someone else's might but that doesn't refuse and it doesn't ignore the fact that Jesus is poised for a moment. Can I have the worship team, please? So I pray we have an understanding, gentle environment where we love each other long enough and strong enough for truth to set us free. Sexuality and talking about this, I think, is important as it allows us all to talk about it together and amongst each other as we follow Jesus in an ever-intensifying society around sexuality. And that maybe this, the word on the street, maybe the word on the street needs to change. Maybe, maybe the word on the street about where we stand and, 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 and the, the environment that we have here is, is not a true reflection of what we believe Jesus to be. And uh, maybe, maybe it is. Uh, and, and, and so maybe, maybe the whole idea of God refining us in this space is to prepare us that the word on the street might be if someone in our city that's struggling with their sexual, sexuality and is seeking an element to transform their life, a physician won't be able to help them. The young man who canceled his operation. I know of a young man who had the operation. Years of pain, suffering, and torment to change his sexual form was not the element to set him free. He, he never went into a future of peace. And I praise God that that young man as a follower of Jesus in his world. And that follower of Jesus in his world has been set free to, to, to not separate the belief this person has in this and embracing this person in the calamity. I praise God that Jesus was able to walk through a crowd where Pharisees refused to stand 
where religious upholders and believers refused to pass through in case they were contaminated by someone else's sin. And Jesus was in the midst, allowing himself going slow enough that the woman of faith could reach out and touch him. And so it is my prayer as we worship this morning that God does business with us and we do business with him in the whole area of our faith, the whole area of our movements, that we can just slow the pace, not have to have all the answers, but allow enough time for the one who does to be touched. So we're going to worship, and I'm going to ask you to press through your experiences, to press through what you've been told, to press through what I've just told you over the last few weeks, to press through all that. Take a hold of Jesus this morning. And go, you're the element. You're the one thing that can transform and change my mindsets, my life, my behaviors. You're the one, you're the one who enables and empowers me to overcome those instinctive movements of my body and my flesh. That I in fact can be washed, sanctified, and justified. That I in fact was unclean and polluted, filthy in sin. But I've been washed by the remission, the baptism, and the cleansing of sin through my faith in Jesus. And that there's someone that needs my testimony. There's someone that needs my reach. There's someone that needs my environment, my space to track this out because I've been sanctified, I've been cleansed, purified, consecrated, and dedicated to a whole new kind of life. I am and I have had righteousness rendered to me. And I'm gonna show and exhibit the nature and the characteristics of God. Because such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let's worship Him this morning.